Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, it occurred to me that I had never done a reaction to Timothy Dexter, the dumbest rags to riches story over on Sam Onella, and this is one people have asked for for a while. So I thought we'd dive into it today. As always, a link is in the description uh, if you want to see it without my commentary. I'll also throw some links down there to some of my reactions to other Sam Onella content over time. He's not for everyone, and I get that. And if you're not into his style of humor and presentation, I totally understand that. Big shout out to John in Blue Ridge Manor, Kentucky. John, we've had the chance to meet, and I know you're coming on one of our upcoming trips. So excited to hang out with you when the time comes. Also, Randall in East Lake here in Northeast Ohio. Thank you guys so much for your support on Patreon. And I will be updating the end screen to reflect our new executive producer and producer level patrons. I only update that every couple of weeks. So um, if you're watching for your name, it will appear soon. Let's dive in. By Skillshare. Hey kids, now we all know that fate is a fickle thing. Some of us may try to defy its will, but there's enough small businesses with Pizza Hut roofs out there to tell you that such a thing is ultimately futile. As for- So, that is such a great point. Small businesses with Pizza Hut roofs. There are certain buildings, now Pizza Hut hasn't gone out of business obviously, but sometimes they close down locations. We have one of those buildings here in the town that I live in that used to be a Pizza Hut with that kind of hat top to it. Uh, we also have a lot of former blockbuster and Hollywood videos here in town that are now like car repair shops and different things like that. That's kind of funny. No small businesses with Pizza Hut roofs out there to tell you that such a thing is ultimately futile. As for most of us, we tend to have our fair share of good and bad luck throughout our lives. But every now and then, RN Jesus smiles upon some drooling little loaf child and says, You, my son, you shall be the one with all the figgy pudding. That child was Timothy Dexter. Dexter was born in Malden, Massachusetts in 1747. He had a humble upbringing. Drop so context here, 1747, he's born in Massachusetts and so, so uh, when he's coming into his teen years, it, we're dealing with the French and Indian War. Uh, and then he's going to kind of come of age right at the time that everything's going down with the American Revolution, right? Uh, he'd be 30 years old when the, the revolution, or in his late 20s, when the revolution breaks out in Massachusetts. Dropping out of school as an eight-year-old to work as a farmhand and a leather worker, but Dexter thought he deserved better, so when he grew up, he married one Elizabeth Frothing Ham, a rich widow in need of company. Gold digging achieved, he began his quest to become a true aristocrat. As his first step, he thinks, hmm, all the rich guys I know are in positions of power, I should run for office. Now the town of Malden wasn't much keen on appointing a bumbling second grade dropout, but after rejecting dozens of petitions sent in by Dexter, they eventually gave up and decided to just make some shit up, leading to Dexter becoming the official informer of deer, tasking him with keeping logs on the local deer population. And over statistics of does and bucks alike, Dexter ruled with an iron fist, triumphantly concluding what many had already known, that there weren't any deer in Malden, Massachusetts. What? What, what is happening? I'm already really confused by what's going on with this guy. Wow. Satisfied with his political career, Dexter then set his sights on greater financial ventures. So a little history, in 1775, as part of our growing independence from Britain, the Continental Congress decided to establish their own currency, known as the Continental Dollar, real creative there, then the revolution- Which, time to mention one of my ancestors, my ninth great grandfather, ninth? I think it's ninth great grandfather, uh, on the direct mail line, so like my father's 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 father, was one of the people who signed the Continental Currency. I haven't gotten my hands on any of it yet, but if you happen to ever get a hold of any Continental Currency that has the signature of a guy named Snowden on it, hook me up, man. The Revolutionary War started, and it dawned on people that these pieces of paper wouldn't be very useful in a giant pile of wet tea and smoldering patriots, causing their value to do one of those horny eagle death spirals. Then the Congress did- So. For the most part, paper currency isn't used at this time, and that's why, because it's so easy to devalue. And there were actually schemes by the British to flood the colonies with counterfeit currency to devalue it even more. And, oh my gosh, I'm going to mention another ancestor. <laughs> I have another ancestor. His last name was Winstead, who uh, his son, actually, Francis Winstead, was a, a soldier in the Continental Army, but the father 
was counterfeiting money for the British, and he actually was hanged by the Americans for his role in flooding the uh, continent with currency. It, you know, that stupid thing that every high schooler learns is stupid, not invading Russia in winter, but the other one, practically making them worth less than their weight in paper and ink. And wouldn't yep. you know it, a good portion of the Continental Army was paid with these. So by the time the war ended, many veterans were left totally destitute. The aristocrats were like, well, these grass-eating untermenches did kind of give us a country, so whatever, we'll throw them a few cents and take this trash off their hands. De yeah, that's kind of how it happened, but it also was a big scam as well, right? Uh, and this is, Alexander Hamilton was kind of tangentially connected to this, and he was actually accused of being involved in it. There's no evidence he was, uh, but he knew some people who were. And so what would happen is these guys would go around to all these veterans because these veterans were being convinced that this promise of these bonds uh, was not going to, the, the government wasn't going to be able to honor it. And so men would come around and they would offer them pennies on the dollar. Like I'll give you 10 cents for each dollar's worth of these bonds that you have. Knowing full well that the assumption plan was going through and that the government was getting its ducks in a row and it was going to be able to honor this stuff. So that they'd make a killing when they were able to cash them in. Well, then that became a big problem where the government had to debate, what do we do? Do we honor the money from the person it was issued to? Or do we allow these guys who have bought this stuff up to cash in? Dexter was like, ooh, ooh, I'm a wealthman. I I'm going to do that too. And he spent the majority of his savings buying a boatload after boatload of the 1780s equivalent of blockbuster gift cards. By all accounts, this should have been his ruin. But by some stroke of luck, after the Constitution was ratified, the new government decided that they trade Continentals for treasury bonds worth 1% of their face value. Doesn't sound like much, but keep in mind, Dexter bought thousands of crates of bills for fractions of pennies apiece. So as buybacks began across the country, his stockpile appreciated massively massively in value, and this informer of Deer realized that, for the first time, there were a lot of bucks in Malden. But just because he was now a man of the upper crust doesn't mean he let it go to his head. Sure, he might have purchased the most luxurious chateau that money could buy, through daily Playboy Mansion-style ragers, and commissioned over 40 statues of America's greatest heroes, one of which was of himself, with a plaque- Of course it was. <laughs> Another thing that was happening during this time is that westward expansion was beginning on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains, which had been barred by treaty under the British. But now that the British weren't in charge anymore, the Americans were flooding into places like Ohio and Kentucky and Tennessee. And they also gave land grants to a lot of these veterans. So um, that's why folks like me who have a who pretty much all of my ancestry runs through eastern Kentucky and eastern Tennessee Almost all of my ancestors who were of age were Revolutionary War veterans because that's pretty much who settled these areas. Uh, and so, again, men with wealth would get out ahead of that and they'd go out and start gobbling up land in these places that had been off limits, knowing they'd be able to turn around and partition it back to people and make a ton of money. Calling him, quote, the greatest philosopher in the Western world. Despite his incredibly tacky displays of wealth, his contemptuous contemporary still saw him for the loud, illiterate rube he was. So they started giving him deliberately awful investment tips in order to get him to bankrupt himself. One such piece of advice was that he should ship warming pans to the Caribbean. For those of you born after 1850, a warming pan's this dish on a long pole that you fill up with hot coals to warm up your bed. Not much use in a tropical paradise. But Dexter was undeterred by such frivolous things as logic, went ahead and sent over 40,000 of them to the West Indies. When they arrived, the locals didn't really know what they were looking at and decided to use them as ladles for the sugar and molasses refineries. And by the end of it, Dexter sold every single one at a markup of nearly 80%. Frustrated- My gosh. This guy really is the dumbest rags to riches story. Good for him, though that their plan backfired, the elites then told him to literally carry coal to Newcastle, which is an old idiom used to describe a pointless task based off the fact that Newcastle was one of the world's biggest producers of coal. The only idioms Dexter knew about all involved different animals shitting in the woods, so he took their word on good faith and went along with it. But by some divine providence, by the time the shipment arrived, the Newcastle coal miners had all gone on strike, and Dexter once again cleared the entire shipment with a hefty profit. He was like, man, I am so smart. By this point, he was pretty confident in his speculation skills, so he started making seemingly far-fetched ventures. I'll Here's the problem with this, and I can kind of see where this is going when he's talking about confidence. 
uh, is that because this guy has lucked into all of this, it would have been very easy for him to just believe, you know what, I am ridiculously good at this. I am smart. I am capable. You know, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough and doggone it, people like me. Uh, Saturday Night Live reference. Um, can't believe that guy became a senator, by the way. <laughs> But anyway, um, yeah, so a lot of times people will be fooled by good luck into thinking that it was all their skill. And then when skill actually matters, it all falls apart. All by himself. One time he had a bunch of stray cats rounded up for basically free, which sounds like herding cats, but what do I know? And he sent them to the Caribbean, where they were gobbled up en masse. Not like eaten, but purchased to deal with all the rat infestations. In another instance, he bought up just about every whale bone in Boston. And coincidentally, at the same time in France, men started wearing corsets too for some reason. Demand went way up, Dexter's laughing. Now from an outside perspective, at the end of the day, Dexter was a very shrewd merchant. So at this point in my research, I was like, wait a minute, is he smart? Then I learned about his life outside of business. Dexter considered himself extremely knowledgeable on just about every topic. Key words, considered himself. For example, he once stumbled stumbled upon a guy painting a sign to go along with the newly built statue of Jefferson. And when he saw that the sign called Jefferson the writer of the Declaration of Independence, Dexter lost his freaking mind and insisted that Jefferson did not pen the DOI, but rather the Constitution. Spoiler alert, not remotely true, he was in France at the time. An easy mistake to make today, sure, but this was only... No, it shouldn't be an easy mistake to make today or then, yes, Jefferson was actually part of a committee. He, he was the primary author, definitely. And it's one of the few things that I will acknowledge and give J Thomas Jefferson a ton of credit for. Because the Declaration of Independence is an absolutely brilliant document. And it, the, the wording and just... I, there are a few things that kind of give me goosebumps when it comes to thinking about things that have been written. The Declaration of Independence is, is up there. It's good, good stuff. All downhill from there for Jefferson. But... Um, yeah, he was part of a committee, and he was given the primary task uh, of drawing it up. But John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, others were part of it. But yeah, he had nothing to do with the Constitution. That's Madison, Hamilton, George Washington was there. Like 10 years after the fact. That's like someone today saying, Obama didn't kill bin Laden, dumbass. That was Bill Clinton. Anyway, when the painter refused to change the inscription, Dexter started shooting. Obama didn't kill bin Laden. Obama authorized the mission that killed bin Laden. Bin Laden, okay, semantics, I know. Shooting at him with a long rifle until he complied. Real gentil. Dexter made sure to surround himself with the requisite wait, wait, number- Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> he told a guy at gunpoint to change a sign to say that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Constitution. All right. ...of weirdos to maintain this level of delusion, one of which was Jonathan Plummer, a man whom Dexter paid to be his poet laureate, writing only the most laudatory odes in his honor. Mind you, this wasn't just your run-of-the-mill, wise and wizened wordsmith. Jonathan sold fish for a living, and porn. He just kind of went along with the whole thing for the pocket change. Besides his entourage, Dexter occasionally spent time with the total geeds known as his family. He had two children, whom the New England Historical Society describes as a half-mad drunk and a completely mad drunk, respectively. And he couldn't- wait, wait. was the- the daughter? Was that a daughter? A completely mad drunk? stand his wife on account of her perceived constant nagging, to the point where he would tell guests he was unmarried and that he just had a ghost in his house. Just like, oh yeah, that's a sea hag. You know, mansion built on some old Indian shipwreck or something. Listen, I realize these are real people and that I shouldn't be entertained by this, but I'm actually kind of liking the guy. <laughs> He's an idiot in some ways. And doesn't sound like a very nice guy in terms of how he treated his wife, but maybe the wife was kind of awful. And I don't know, but it's kind of funny. Timmy, please. I'm cold and my hands are rheumatic. Find it in your heart to light the fireplace for me? Yeah, plenty of that in hell, you banshee bitch. One day, in a massive stroke of ego, Dexter decided to fake his own death, complete with a lavish funeral service just to see who would show up. Lucky for him, about 3,000 people from all walks of life turned up. Though initial Of course he did this. Kind of awesome, too staying out of sight, he soon noticed that his wife wasn't crying. So in response, he jumped out and started hitting her upside the head with a cane. And <laughs> this can't be real. This can't really have happened. But I know too well from Samonella's past videos that he doesn't make this stuff up. So 
Dang, dude. Front of everybody. But as his true mortality grew closer, Dexter knew he needed a legacy and decided to pen his memoirs titled A Pickle for the Knowing Ones, which was basically just 20 pages of unhinged ranting about politics, religion, his wife, and whatever else came to mind. No punctuation, random capitalization, the most amazing spelling I've ever seen. I will Here's say this about the random capitalization. That's a common thing back then. I'm working on a video that's going to be coming out next week, uh, some original content. Uh, I have about a half hour video kind of talking about the events of 1776 and the revolution. And you're going to see on the screen George Washington's letter to Charles Lee ordering him to build up the defenses of the city of New York, uh, of city of New York. And there's random capitalization all through that letter. Excerpts. George Washington. Attitude, philosopher, tobacco, general. And this is all just from the first few lines. The entire book is written like this. And just like everything else the guy did, the thing sold like fucking hotcakes. Why does anybody it. even try? The best part is that when he got complaints about the total lack of grammatical anything, in the second edition of the book, he put an extra page at the end full of nothing but punctuation marks with a little note saying that anyone who felt like whining could just stick them wherever. Wait, I want to read this. Fowler, Mr. Printer, the knowing ones complain of my book. The first edition had no stops. I put in enough here and that, and they may pepper and salt it as they please. Wow, dude could not spell they wanted. Dexter died in 1806, and by and large, he probably should have ended up in Davy Jones's locker. But given the circumstances, I imagine the big man upstairs dropped his big deck of mortal soul trading cards at just the right moment, letting him slip through the pearly gates undetected. And legend has it that to this day, if you pray to the name Timothy Dexter, he'll look upon you kindly and share his skills with you all. Wait a minute. Share? Skill. Skill share. Yep, there it comes. All right, let's see what else we can learn about this guy. Okay, so this is his house. This is what it looked like back in the day, anyway. Uh, apparently, it's still there and can be visited to this day. A um, little bit of information here. His, the probate office valued his estate at roughly $700,000 in today's money. Um, looks like it was bought in 1984 for $200,000 and restored the house. I uh, became a hotel for a while. Storms ruined most of his statues. The only identified surviving statue is that of William Pitt. I'm a little disappointed that the Timothy Dexter statue didn't exist. It uh, doesn't exist anymore. At the age of 50, he authored the book A Pickle for the Knowing Ones. Uh, it's 8,800 words and 33,864 letters, but without any punctuation and with unorthodox spelling and capitalization. Okay, so, wow. Wow, I'm kind of interested to know more about this guy, but that'll have to come for another day. So let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Big thank you to Jeremy in Houston, Texas, and Drake in Cordova, Tennessee. Thank you guys so much for your support. We'll see you again soon.